All right. Good morning. Good to see you on Easter Sunday. Facebook friend, we welcome you and happy Resurrection Sunday. Watching us through live streaming. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are here, grab your Bible and turn to page 15. Page 15, lead me to Calvary. Let's stand if you're able and sing this wonderful song about page 15, lead me to Calvary. The chorus goes like this, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. So let's sing this song, let's lift up our voice, sing this song, let's worship the risen Savior. We are celebrating a risen Savior. We are, uh, the, the tomb is empty and the cross is empty. Jesus is alive. And that's what we're, we're celebrating. Uh, that's what uh, Easter is all about, the resurrection, uh, celebrating the resurrection of Christ. So page 15, lead me to Calvary as Brother Jerry leads us into this wonderful song. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine number 31 in our song books hymn number 31 he lives hymn number 31 he lives Oh, my heart. 
Savior. After the service, everybody's going to receive a chocolate cross. So we do that every year. So, and the cross is empty. No Jesus hanging on the cross. He went to the cross one time. He died. He was buried. And he rose again. And the tomb is empty. And he lives forevermore. Amen. Um, I want to thank those who, uh, thanks Brother Jerry for already already cutting the grass that's a sign that summer is almost here so uh, the grass is getting green now so thank you brother Jerry for uh, cutting the grass thank you for those who clean the church and um, uh, Diane thank you for the the Lord using you to do the floor you notice the floor is nice and clean and wax and um, the Lord put it in Diane's heart and I want to express my thanksgiving Diane for doing that for the Lord's house. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I know we have, uh, we recognize her this morning. We have a visitor, Miss Lady. We heard two beautiful daughters are here this morning for the first time. And um, I know we gave her a, a Sunday school uh, welcome, but let's give her a, a 11 o'clock morning service. Welcome for being here today. <clears throat> hey, Brother Jerry, yeah, thank you. Get her a, a Spanish visitors back. Anybody else visiting for the first time? Anybody else? We have a young man here uh, visiting uh, here. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Let's give him a hand too. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Man, will you come? And we take the offering now. The offering is only for the regular God's people. If you're here for the first time, we're not here to take your money, let the play pass by. We're just happy that you're here. And before the, uh, the message, before the message, um, we're gonna have a special, we're gonna have a special song, so I'll look forward for that special song. And let's continue to get the gospel out. Uh, for, for the uh, Christian, uh, celebrating Christ's resurrection, for the Christian, it should not be once a year, every day. Every day that we get up, amen, we, we are we're living Christ. We are a proof that he's alive because he saved us. He gave us new life. So uh, for, for the Christian, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ every day, every single day. So uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for, Lord, for giving us Jesus, Heavenly Father. You gave us the greatest gift, the gift of eternal life. 
through Jesus Christ the Lord. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord, Lord. The Apostle Paul calls it the unspeakable gift. It's indescribable, Lord. And we don't deserve Jesus. We don't deserve the new birth, the new life in Christ. But thank you for uh, allowing somebody to preach the gospel to us, Lord. And we put our faith on that risen Savior. And now, because he lived, we live. We're born again. And if there's somebody here this morning not born again, I pray that they, re they get born again as soon as possible before it's too late. Because today is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. And Lord, we know that you want to save the whole world. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anybody could be saved. Because God, Jesus Christ, would never reject a sinner. Him that come to me, I will in no way cast out. John 6, 37. Lord, bless the, the offering, bless the giver. Uh, bless the, the song. Bless the most important part of the service, the preaching, Lord. I know the preaching, bless it in English and Spanish. And may your name be glorified, Lord. We want you to be pleased, Lord. We want to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray this. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please stand for our third hymn this morning. It should be on the sheets. If you uh, need the song sheets for the third hymn, it's called Because He Lives. Please raise your hand and uh, the ushers will bring one to you. So let's look at those song sheets now. Because He Lives, a great hymn of the faith uh, dealing with the resurrection, what we are rejoicing in our hearts on this day, and like as Pastor mentioned, we should be, we should have that in our heart every day. This is the, and as was taught in Sunday school, we have, we have no salvation without the resurrection. The Lord Jesus, he conquered sin and death, and he's bringing us with him if we are saved, if we are in Christ. We have that hope of resurrection that one day our vile bodies will be made like unto his glorious body. If we are saved, our soul is now resurrected and is given the gift of eternal life. So let's look at those song sheets now because he lives and let's sing unto the Lord this great hymn together this morning.
of Matthew in chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, looking at verses 22 and 23, Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. So there in the book of Matthew in chapter 17, starting in verse 22, the word of the Lord reads. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Amen. Please be seated. Now at this time we have a special to be sung for us, so please let us all uh, meditate on the words and prepare our hearts for the message this morning. is Christ. 
Amen. Good to see, good to see you, Yvonne. What a blessing. God's been good to you, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see your daughter. Good to see you. Good to see you. Miss you guys. Praying for you, and good to see you this morning. Amen. <laughs> Title of my message this morning is "Why We Believe Jesus Rose from the Dead." Why we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And by the way, the evidence are overwhelming that he rose from the dead. They're overwhelming. So uh, uh, the Easter story is a message of hope. Yet many people celebrate this holiday with only chocolate bunnies, you know, chocolate uh, bunnies and egg hunt. And the reason is because they do not know its real purpose. They didn't know his real purpose. The real purpose of Easter is this incredible news. Christ has risen from the dead, just like he promised he would. That's Easter. That's what Easter is all about. Christ, that's the good news, the greatest news that we need to share with the world, that Christ has risen from the dead just as he promised. Christ is alive. And the evidence is overwhelming. Why we believe Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today? Well, let me just give you some reasons, some biblical reasons why we could be sure, absolutely sure, that Jesus Christ, indeed, right there, hallelujah, he has risen. He has risen indeed. How do we know? Well, we, the evidence are overwhelming, overwhelming. But let me give you some reason. The, the first solid reason that we could be sure that Jesus Christ rose from the dead physically is because the Old Testament prophesied it. The Old Testament prophesied it in Psalm 22. You don't have to turn there, but in Psalm 22, that whole Psalm 22 talks about the, the uh, coming Messiah. Uh, uh, the Old Testament scripture prophesied that Jesus will die by crucifixion. This is found, found in Psalm 22 in verses 14 through 16. And, I mean, it talks about the last word that he said, My God, my God, what thou hast forsaken me. This is on Psalm 22, verse 1. So, his crucifixion was prophesied. In Old Testament scripture, especially in Psalm 22, in verses 14 to 16, that he was going to die by crucifixion. And I share that in Sunday school. That, that happened a thousand years before even Jesus was crucified. Crucifixion was not even invented yet. That's why this is an incredible book. This is an inspired book. This is a reliable book. This is a trustworthy book. This is God's word. And there's many predictions that are predicted that are going to come to pass. So they predicted, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that he was going to die by crucifixion. Also in Psalm 16, verse 10, it says this, Psalm 16, verse 10, For thou would not leave my soul in hell, neither would thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. And this psalm applies to the resurrection of Jesus. The Holy Spirit inspired David to prophetically write of Jesus right here on Psalm 1610. 
He says, thy holy one. He will not see corruption. Christ's lifeless body was kept from corruption for three days. His holy body never suffered the corruption of decomposition. Before that could set in, God the Father miraculously raised Jesus from the dead. So praise the Lord. So he rose from the dead. Christ is Allah. He lives. He lives. So why we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I said, number one, the Old Testament prophesies it. And I just, I just gave you, I just gave you two prophecies. There's many other prophecies in the Bible that talks about that he's going to come and that he was going to be crucified and they were going to kill him and he was going to suffer for our sin and he was going to die and he was going to be buried and he's going to rise again the third day. Why we believe it? Because the Old Testament prophesied it. That's why. Number two, Jesus predicted his own resurrection. Jesus predicted his own resurrection. And this is in the text that Brother Jared let us in reading in Matthew chapter 17 in verse 22 and 23. Jesus told his disciples, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of man, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. Listen, if Jesus did not rise again, then he's the biggest fake that ever lived. Because he predicted his own resurrection. If Jesus did not rise again, he's the biggest fake, the greatest fake that ever lived on this earth. He's the biggest imposter that ever lived on this earth. He's the biggest quack that ever lived on this earth. And the Christian faith is, is a foolish fantasy for us. We're living in a fantasy land. If that did not happen, if Jesus could make and live out this claim, then he's clearly sufficient to keep all his promises. And the empty tomb proved that everything Jesus said was true. Mark it down. Anything that Jesus says from is true, you could take Jesus at his word. So the empty tomb proved that everything Jesus said was true. Why do I believe Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today? Because Jesus predicted his own resurrection and it came to pass. It came to pass. There was a skeptic who was talking to a little girl one day. And this little girl, she loved the Lord with all her heart. And this skeptic was trying to shake her faith, trying to put doubts on her faith. And he said, young lady, Christianity is not the only religion, you know. There are plenty of religions out there. There are plenty of Christ out there. Young lady, which Christ do you believe in? And I love her answer. She thought for a minute, and she said, the one who was raised from the dead. That's the one I believe in. Amen? And by the way, that's the one I'm preaching this morning. That's the one I believe in. Amen? The one that rose from the dead. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen? Brother Jerry led us into that psalm. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. Our long life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how he lived. He lives within my heart. Because he lived, I live. And all those who are saved this morning, born again, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, they could, they, they could also testify, they're witnesses that Christ lives because he lives within their heart. And if he's not living in your heart, then you, you're suffering a great loss. And if you die without Christ, you are walking on thin ice. And the only thing that's keeping you from dying and going to hell is your heart is still beating and you're hanging on a spider web if you don't get born again and get this new life that Christ offers. Man, it will give you the opportunity to get saved this morning. If you don't know Christ, if you have any doubt about your salvation, if you got any doubt that Christ is living in your heart. So, but here's the third reason that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, not only because it was prophesied, 
in the Old Testament Holy Scriptures, not only because Jesus predicted his own resurrection, and that proved that whatever Jesus says is going to come to pass. Number three, many people saw the resurrected Christ. After he, was, after he died, he was buried, third day, he rose again the third day. There's many people, many witnesses who saw the resurrected Christ. And the proof is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because that whole chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that whole chapter, 58 verses, Paul deals proving evidence after evidence that Jesus indeed rose again from the dead. Amen? And I read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You want to follow along in your Bible, go ahead. Verses 3 and 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 6. The Apostle Paul said, Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for I deliver unto you first, of all that which I also receive, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of, of about 500 brethren at once. Stop right there. That's a lot of witnesses. That is a lot. Many people saw the resurrected Christ. They looked at his face. They touched him. They heard his voice. They saw him eat. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then all these witnesses were a bunch of fakes. They were a bunch of phonies. They were a bunch of imposters and a bunch of quacks. No, the truth of the matter is, was that the resurrection was real to them. You know why? Because here's the four, four solid reasons that Jesus rose from the dead. Because those people who saw the resurrected Christ, all those witnesses, they were real witnesses. They were credible witnesses. Amen? They were, they were not liars. They were not dreaming or hallucinating. They were real, genuine, credible witnesses. Today, today we have witnesses. We hear on the radio or on the news about, about witnesses that are not credible. Uh, they're, they're uh, uh, liars. Well, not these witnesses. These witnesses were real credible witnesses. How I know that? Because the life of those who saw the resurrected Christ, their life were revolutionized. I mean, it radically changed their life. What an impact the resurrection of Christ had in them. What an impact. Before the resurrection, these witnesses, they were cowards. When Jesus was arrested in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Mark chapter 14, in verse 50, it says they all forsook him and fled. They, they were cowards before the resurrection. They forsook Christ. Even Peter, you know the story about Peter? Even Peter denied Christ. Even Peter swore that he don't even know Jesus. He even lied and cursed. Even Peter denied him. After the resurrection, these cowards fear no one in their proclamation of the risen Christ. After, it had an impact on them. It revolutionized their life. Before, they were cowards. They were ashamed. They were hiding their Christianity. After, they came out boldly ready to die for the faith. And with the power of the, of the resurrection, the power of Christ that was upon them, they proclaimed boldly Christ to a Christ-rejecting society. It revolutionized their life. It had a tremendous impact in their life. From cowards, they became courageous. This is in Acts chapter 4, in verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, Christian, if you're saved this morning, that power that rose Jesus from the dead, that power is available for you to use to preach the risen Savior. You could go over and you should receive power. After the Holy Ghost come upon you, you should be witnesses unto me. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And I hope you're using the power, Christian. I hope you exercise. You don't need to be afraid. You have the power guiding you. And it was the power of the resurrection that was upon them that they preached with so much boldness. They were cowards. Now they became courageous, proclaiming the risen Christ. The resurrection became the central message 
of the early church. The church grew. The church grew with an unwavering conviction that Christ had risen and he was the Lord of the church. He was the head of the church. The resurrection revolutionized Peter's life. Peter, he revolutionized his life. The one after, after he denied him, the, the resurrection revolution impacted his life. It had a tremendous impact because we see in, in Acts chapter 2, in verses 23 to 24, we see Peter, Peter, under the power of the Holy Spirit, he was preaching the gospel to, to uh, Jews that hated Christ, that wanted the, 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 uh, they rejected Christ. And he says in Acts chapter 2, in verse 23 and 24, he said, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified whom God have raised up. Preaching the resurrection of Christ, Peter, it transformed his life. It impacted Peter's life. Not only that, it had a tremendous impact in Paul's life in Acts chapter 9 in Damascus Road. We know Paul. Paul was a persecutor of the truth. Paul, Paul, Paul hated Christian. He killed Christian. And the apostle Paul met the risen Savior at Damascus Road. And it transformed his life. And in Acts chapter 9, in verse 20, from a prosecutor, from a, a persecutor, he became a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 9, in verse 20, it says, And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. And the apostle Paul had a tremendous impact. He met the risen Savior. And he said in Philippians chapter 1, in verse 21, For me to live is Christ this risen Christ, and to die is gain. By the way, what, what are you living for? Money? Fame? Material things? What are you living for? For things that, that is going to uh, uh, satisfy the loss of your eyes, the loss of the flesh? If you're living for that, if that's what consumes you, then when you die, it's not gain. It's loss. But Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. When you live wholeheartedly for the risen Savior, after you die, that's not in vain. That is not a waste of life. That's great gain. That's great gain. Why Paul say that? The power of the resurrection of Christ. It impacts his life. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, there was something burning in the apostle Paul's heart. There was a, something that was consuming the apostle Paul's heart. It was beating his heart. It was consuming him every day. What was it? Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul said what consumes him is I want to know this risen Christ more. I want to have a deeper knowledge with this risen Christ, this risen Savior that I met at Damascus Road. I need his power in my life. I want the power to live the victorious Christian life. And we have it in Christ. We have it. And then he said, in the fellowship of his suffering, you live for Christ, you will suffer. Like he suffered, but you're in good company. You're in good company. What happened to these coward disciples who all forsook him and fled? What turned those groups of coward into flaming evangelists who turned the world upside down because that's exactly what they did they, after the resurrection they turned the world upside down with the gospel of christ in Acts chapter 17 in verse 6 and they were willing to die for their beliefs in acts chapter 5 in verse 28 and 29 it tells us that the chief priests came to peter and the other apostles and commanded them you should not teach in his name you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Wouldn't that be great if we fill Perfan boy with the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what we need to do, amen? All of us, if you're saved, let's fill Perfan boy with the gospel of Christ. That's the hope of Perfan boy. That's the cure for their problems, Christ. So they say you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And then Peter and the apostles. And they say, you know, you can't do that. You're not allowed. That's illegal. You can't preach Christ's name. On the, you can't do that. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. 
This is the chief priest commanded them to know that. And I love the way that Peter and the apostles answer them. They say, we are to obey God rather than man. Amen. We're, we're, and in Acts chapter 5, verse 30, it says, The God of our Father raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hang on a tree. And then in verse 32, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Christian, if you're saved this morning, the Holy Ghost lives in you. You got a great helper that called the Holy Ghost. And you know what? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, wrote the Bible. And you know, if he lives in you, if you yield to him, he wants to promote Christ. He wants to preach Christ. Because that's what the Holy Ghost does. That's his main mission, to proclaim Christ. And if you're, the Holy Ghost is given to those who obey him, if you go in obedience to the Holy Ghost, you got power, don't be afraid to preach Christ, even in a world that when it's not popular, when they reject the gospel, you preach it with the power of Christ. You yield to the Holy Spirit like they did. And somebody will get touched. I was a Christ rejecter one time, and I heard it, and I got touched. And my life had been revolutionized. I believe there's somebody out there that God is working in that person's heart. God is waiting on you to preach Christ to them. They're out there. And it says here, and then they, in, in Acts chapter 5, in verse 40 and 41, it says, and they took the apostles, and they beat them and commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they, they let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they have counted an honor to suffer shame for his name. Wow. They were beaten up. They, has, they, they were beaten, and, and they, were, they were hurting, and uh, probably bleeding. And they came out rejoicing that they had suffered from Jesus' name. This is real Christians right here. This is real Christians. Nothing could stop them. May God raise up real Christians like that today. They're not afraid to, to, to let Christ stick out of them. And in Acts chapter 5, in verse 42, it said that daily and in the temple, in every house, they cease not to preach Jesus Christ. What caused these cowards to turn into flaming evangelists? I mean, what caused these cowards to turn the world upside down and willing to die? They were willing to die for their beliefs. One thing, one thing, they witnessed the resurrection. That's what caused them from being coward to become flaming evangelists, fire passionate witnesses for Christ. One thing, they witnessed the resurrection. The resurrection had a transforming effect on them that it revolutionized their life. They went to their death as martyrs because they knew in their heart that they serve a risen Savior. Amen. Look, man will die for something they knew is true. Man will never die for something they know is false. And by the way, they knew it was true. And they die an ugly death. It was an ugly death that these apostles died. I mean, they, some were skin alive. Some were beheaded. Some were stoned. Some were crucified and beaten to death. Some were stabbed to death. All they had to do was to deny Christ, and they didn't. Why we believe Jesus rose from the dead? Why believe, we believe that he's alive today? Because the Old Testament prophesied it. Because the Old Testament prophesied it. Because Jesus predicted his own resurrection. Because many people saw the resurrected Christ. Many. Number four, because the lives of those who saw the resurrected Christ were revolutionized. Number five, here's another reason why we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Men and women today, listen, men and women today testify that the power of the risen Christ has transformed their life. Many women today, men and women today, could testify that the power of the risen Christ has transformed their life. 
We know that Jesus is alive not only because of the historical and because of the biblical evidence, but also because he has miraculously touched our lives. By the way, you guys are the witnesses to what I'm saying. Which Christ are you representing? A dead Jesus or a living Jesus? How, how alive you are spiritually. How passionate you are about the things of God. Which, that determines which Christ you are representing. The living Christ that they represented or a dead Christ that's still in the grave? Which one are you representing? Where's the joy of the Lord, Christian? Where's the passion? Where's the fire? Where's the commitment? When, why we hide the gospel, why we hide the good news when people, that's what they need. Other than that, they're going to die without Christ and spend eternally in hell. The Bible is true because it gave me an experience of a new life promise in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I experienced that verse, that promise of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What is it? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's the resurrected Christ. He's what? A new creature. All things pass away. And behold, all things are becoming new. Look, I say people, we're not just nice people. We need to be nice people, loving people. We're not just nice people. We're new creatures. We're new creatures. And when Jesus arose from the dead, we arose with him. We have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that is available for us to live the victorious spiritual life. We have come out of the grave. We have come out of the grave of the old life. We have been raised to walk in the newness of life, according to Romans chapter 6 in verse 4. Listen, how do you explain this preacher, Jose Santos, a former drug dealer? How do you explain that, a former drug dealer? who came in as a former drug dealer looking for a light chain, and now he's born again, he's a new creature, and he's a preacher of the gospel. How do you explain that? The power of the resurrection of Christ. That's the only way to explain it. How do you explain a former drug dealer? How do you explain a former fornicators involved in all kinds of sexual immorality, a former party animal, a former jail inmate? There's only one way to explain it, and it's the power of the risen Christ that has transformed my life. And the gospel is still transforming lives. And by the way, you guys are the witnesses. It's easy to say amen, but how about out there? Are you living it? Are you living different than anybody else? Is your life uh, representing the risen Christ that we're talking about? Are you living the new resurrected life? Are you making a difference in other people's life? That says a lot. That's a proof that he's alive by the way you live your Christian life. In Revelation chapter 1, in verse 18, Jesus said this, in Revelation chapter 1, in verse 18, Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen, said Jesus. Jesus is alive forevermore on this earth. Where's the proof? Where's the proof? Well, Old Testament scriptures prophesy. Jesus predicted his own resurrection. Many witnesses, hundreds of them saw him. But not only they saw him, it transformed their life. They were cowards and they became courageous Christians, ready to die for the faith, and they die an ugly death. But look, Jesus is alive forevermore on this earth. Where's the proof? In the life of believers. That's another proof. In the life of believers. I want you to go to Colossians chapter 3. Go to Colossians chapter 3 because the proof is in the life of believers who are born again. They're born again. That's where the proof is. You know, when you go to a courthouse and there's a trial or whatever, you know what's, 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 what's vital in that trial? Witnesses. Witnesses play a, a, a strong role there about, you know, whether the person is guilty or not guilty with the witnesses. And guess what? We are the witnesses. They have hundreds of witnesses that saw Christ. But you know what? Didn't we have an encounter with Christ when we got born again? When the Holy Spirit convicted us? 
And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, when we got born again, we're witnesses of a spiritual resurrection. So Jesus is alive forevermore on this earth. What is the proof in the life of believers? The life of believers. Colossians, go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, if you then be risen with Christ, talking to saved people who are born again, who have this new life in Christ, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitting on the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your affections on the things above, not on the things on earth. Look, we ought to be heavily minded. Our affections should be set on the things above. We ought to be heavily minded. We ought to be heaven focused. We ought to be heaven centered. We ought to emphasize the spiritual Christian. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. You know where's our home? Heaven. That's our real final address. Amen? So don't get too comfortable in this earth. We're supposed to live different. We're supposed to shine for Jesus in this dark world. Why? Because we're heavenly minded. We belong to God. We're citizens of heaven. It says here, set your affection to things above, not things above. Verse 3, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Our new life, my friend, is hid in with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Listen, the day is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will return for his saints. Then we will appear with him in glory. Then men will understand us and realize why we behave the way we did. Why we live different. They're going to understand one day. One day. Since you have died, Christian, and have come back to life spiritually, you are now a new, improved person. You're supposed to be a new, improved person. You know, you're supposed to be different. Since the day you got saved. That's what being, being born again. And that's a powerful proof that Christ is alive. How's the proof? In the life of believers. What a powerful testimony that is. So, listen. You are now a new improved person. What does new self look like? Well, it doesn't look like the old self that is supposed to be dead. Because look, look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. Paul describes... The old self, this is before Christ. We were desperate, we were not alive. And this is the behavior of an unsaved person, the characteristic. The old self consists of, look at Colossians 3, 5. He says, modify therefore your members which are upon the earth. That word modify literally means to put to death. Put to death, put to death your members which are upon the earth. And the members there refers to the members of the human body. Don't we sin with our human bodies? Of course we sin, even though we're safe. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're supposed to glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. But we do sin with our human bodies. And Paul says, put to death the sexual members of our body. We need to consider our bodies dead to such activities. And he's going to mention this sinful activity that we should have no part in it. Because we we got a new resurrected life. We're new creatures in Christ. We represent the living Christ. Amen? And that's a proof that Christ is alive. We represent a living Savior, not a dead Savior. So don't let your Christian testimony be dead. Let people see something different in you. Let Christ stick out of you, Christian. He mentioned this, put to death, this sexual members of our body. Consider our bodies dead to such sinful activity. Look at it, fornication. Colossians 3, 5, fornication. What is that sexual immorality? By the way, before Christ, I was involved in all kinds of sexual immorality. Then I got saved. Then I kept doing it, but I got convicted. I felt dirty. Fornication, he says, there's sexual immorality. Then he mentions uncleanness. That's any form of sexual immorality, such as pornography, lustful thinking. 
And then he mentions inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. What is that? that that's, that's, those are similar terms that refer to evil sexual thinking outside of the marriage relationship. That was before Christ. That was our past. And then he says, he goes on, look what he says, covetousness. Literally, this term means to have more. People just want more, desire to gain more. I just want to, I just want to uh, uh, feed the, the sinful lust of my flesh. I want more. I'm not satisfied. I want more. It's to have more, desire to gain more, especially of things that are forbidden here. And then he said, that's idolatry. He mentioned that is idolatry. When people engage in either greed or the sexual sins that Paul has listed, they follow the desires rather than God's desires. And in essence, you know what you're doing? You're worshiping yourself. You're making yourself a God. That's idolatry, my friend. That's idolatry. There's only one God that we need to bring pleasure and honor, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the God. And then he goes on in Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. He said, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. That's how old say people live. But that's how we used to live before Christ, before we got the new life in Christ. Because if you're living like the devil, like the rest, how are you going to impact anybody for Christ? How, how are you going to prove by your life, by your living a different life, that Christ is alive? Because one proof is not only the scripture, not only that Jesus predicted it, not only that many saw them and got transformed, but by the way Christians live is another powerful proof that Jesus is alive. He says in verse 7, in which you also walk sometime when you live in there. That's how we used to live before Christ. And then Colossians 3a, look what he says. But now you also put off these anger wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Verse 9, lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewing knowledge after the image of him that created him. So that is the old self. That's what it consists of. That's the dead Jerry. That's the dead Diane and the dead Muncie. Amen? Look, we're new because of Christ. We're, 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 we're new, renewed, improved persons. How is, however, the resurrected new and improved self consists of, look at verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, Humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Verse 13, forbearing one another. Look, I, I have no patience with people. Now I could put up with people. You know why? The Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the grace of God, because God is patient with me, so I need to be patient with others. Amen? He says, forgiving one another. If any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And then he goes on in verse 14, and above all these things put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. Verse 15, let, and, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, to that which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonish one another in psalm and hymn and spiritual song, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Look. Christian, we're supposed to be living in this book. The Word of God should be controlling our behavior, not the culture. The Word of God should be governing our lives. And then once the Word of God governs our life, we live different. We don't live like an unsafe person. We don't live like the devil. We don't live like animals, like wild animals. We no restraint. And then we sing good Christian songs. Your music will change too, amen? And then he says, listen, Becoming a Christian means living a resurrected life. It means you exchange the old self for a new and improved self that has been renewed into the image of Christ. And by the way, this new life should be impacting. It impacts your everyday life. Your everyday life should be impacting. 
This means that you get a resurrected, new, improved spouse. You marry people. That's what it means if you're saved. That means you look at your husband, you got a new husband. That means you look at your wife, you got a new wife. In fact, if you see Colossians 3.18, look at it, Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as it fit to the Lord. And then he goes to the husband in Colossians 3.19. Husband, love your wife. And be not bitter against them. If there's a husband right now that is bitter at your wife, walk down the aisle doing that and get right with God. Ask God to forgive you. Or even watching online, ask God to forgive you. Look, husband, don't you love it when your wife looked at you and says, who are you? I mean, what happened to you? You're different. So, what happened to you? You're different. Well, you know what's the answer? I was dead. But now I'm alive. I'm resurrecting Christ. I'm new and improved husband because the resurrected Savior lives in me. That's why your wife should notice about you. That's why your husband should notice about the wife. I mean, it will impact, my friend. It will impact every day of your life. It will impact relationships. This new life. Yes, the resurrection is practical for everyday life. Teens, listen, teens and children. The resurrection means you can offer your parents a new, improved kid. Yes. Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So teens and children, get saved this morning, get right with God, change your rotten attitude with your parents, and, and offer your parents a new, transformed son and daughter and grandkids. That's what we need in this world. That's the revival that we need in our country. And people need to have a serious encounter with the resurrected Christ. And only that, Colossians, parents, parents, it means that you can offer your children godly parents. Parents, you could offer your children godly parents. That's what that means when you, when you met Christ, when you met the resurrected Savior. In, in, in Colossians 3.21, fathers provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. May God have mercy on parents that you're discouraging your children to serve God. You're, you're making, them, making them angry towards the things of God. May God have mercy on you, parents. You could offer them a, what a, to be a golly man or a golly dad or even a golly grandma. Employees. It means that you could offer your boss trustworthy, valuable employees. I mean, this will affect every part of your life. So employees, it means that you could offer your boss trustworthy, valuable employees. Colossians 3.22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleaser, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Man, we need a revival of employees that are, 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 are just great. The, the best valuable employees that your boss has, that he's the kind of boss they say, I want to call churches. I want to hire Christians. Those are the best. What a testimony that is for the, for the, for the gospel of Christ. says, so in, in um, bosses and employers, listen, bosses and employers, it means that your employees get a generous, honorable boss. That's what it means. Colossians 4.1. Masters, give unto your own servant that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. That's what it means, boss. If you're a Christian boss, they ought to, your employee ought to love you. You treat them with justice. You don't play favorites. Amen? You, you, you show them that you are a generous, Christ-loving, Bible follower, Christian boss. That's what it is. I mean, it will impact every relationship of our life when you, when you meet Christ. And that's a powerful testimony. That's a proof that Jesus rose from the dead. The best proof, one of the best proof is the life of a believer. How you living? How you living? Resurrection, the resurrection impacts your everyday life. Are you living the resurrected life or are you a deadbeat? 
then you are representing a dead Jesus. Maybe it's better you keep your mouth shut. Don't even say you're a Christian. Because you do more damage for the cause of Christ. More damage than an atheist. Than those who openly, deliberately deny Christ. Are you, listen, why we believe Jesus rose from the dead? Because it was prophesied in the Old Testament. Why we believe Jesus rose from the dead? Because Jesus predicted his own resurrection. Why we believe Jesus rose from the dead? Because many people saw the resurrected Christ. Why we believe Jesus rose from the dead? Because the life of those who saw the resurrected Christ were revolutionized. It radically changed their life. It had a tremendous impact in them. Why? Because men and women today testify that the power of the risen Christ has transformed their life. Jesus, my friend, is alive today forevermore. Where's the proof? In the life of believers. Are you living a resurrected life? Are you? Well, why don't you come and get saved this morning and get real? Because Christ is real. Let Christ become real to you. Amen? Every head bowed, let's stay on our feet. Every eye closed. How many of you, while our heads are bowed, every eye closed? How many of you can honestly say, Preacher, if I die tonight, because death is unpredictable, one day death is going to knock on your door and he's going to lay his cold hand on you. And the Bible talks about that the Lord knows those who are his. God knows who are his, who are saved, and who are his children. We can't fool anybody. God knows those who are his. How many could honestly say, Pastor, if I die tonight, if I put my, my head in the pillow for the last time tonight and I give my last breath, I am 100% sure that I am born again, that I have this new resurrected life that Christ gave those who are saved. Pastor, that's me. I am 100% sure that I'm saved and I'm born again and that Jesus lives in me. Let me see your hand. That's your testimony. Let me see your hand. My hand's up. How many could, you could lower your hand? How many could say, Pastor, I could not raise my hand? And I appreciate your honesty. Don't be a hypocrite. I appreciate you not trying to pretend to be something you're not because all liars should have their part in the lake which burned with fire. Revelation 21 a. Those of you who could not raise your hand and say, Pastor, I, I'm honest. God knows my heart. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that I'm not safe. I'm doubting. But it concerns me, Pastor. I sure don't want to die and go to hell. It concerns me. Pray for me that I will get born again and that I will get this new spiritual life before I die. Pray for me. If that's you, let me see your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. If that's you. Anybody like that? I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to pray for you. If you're really concerned. If you're concerned. Pastor, I'm not sure. I sure don't want to go to hell, but I want you to pray for me that I will get this new life. Anybody like that? Anybody? I see you. Anybody else? Include me in your prayer. Anybody? Thank you for your honesty. Anybody else? Lord, I, do, I pray for that one person, honest, humble themselves, Lord. And I pray for those, Lord, who they're just full of pride, dear God. They, they don't want to humble themselves, Lord. And I pray that you bring tremendous conviction, Lord, and that you will give them nightmares, Lord. And those of us, Lord, who are not saved, Lord, I pray that you would, you know, God, you don't force people. You know, we could heart in our hearts. I don't know anybody here, Lord. Both, both of you who are saved, but you're not living like a Christian is supposed to live, you need to ask God to forgive you. You are sorry testimony for Christ. You're displeasing him by your sorry testimony. You need to ask God to forgive you this morning. You need to repent. Lord, I pray that you use the invitation, dear God, those who are not saved, that you will not leave them alone, bring tremendous conviction, Lord, give them nightmare until they get saved, because I know you don't want anybody to perish. And those who are saved but they're not living right, Lord, I pray you bring conviction and that this message will cause them to change direction, to choose to follow Christ wholeheartedly, Lord. Lord, and use the message. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation is open. If you need to pray, if you need to respond to the message, the invitation is open.